Good morning, JP here. I'm going to talk for a minute about um, about aluminum welding and avoiding uh, porosity. So, porosity from aluminum is almost entirely from inclusion of hydrogen. Aluminum has an extremely high affinity for hydrogen. It'll grab it from anywhere it possibly can. It loves it. <clears throat> um, three main sources for hydrogen um, for the aluminum to grab hold of. That's from the surface of the workpiece in the form of hydrocarbons that are left behind, whether it's oils or wa like a wax from water and wax solution to uh, in, in a machining process <clears throat> from the atmosphere um, and from itself. So uh, the aluminum already has some hydrogen porosity in it. It's by nature, it's going to have some. Um, question is, how do you how do you deal with it? So from the surface, that's it's given by other things from um, from the atmosphere and and actually from the aluminum itself and the, the hydrogen that's included in that, how do you deal with it? So from the surface, we're talking about, mostly we're talking about oils left over from machining processes that get pushed into little pores and how do you deal with that? So I use, um, I use a three-step cleaning process when I clean aluminum. I use, and maybe more if it's really nasty, I often work with a lot of older scrap material just because it's what's available and uh, aluminum's expensive and I don't always need a big pretty shiny piece. So, uh, so if you're dealing with something like that, you want to be even more um, studious about your cleaning. But uh, um, any piece of aluminum, fr fresh from the mill, fresh from the manufacturer is in need of cleaning before it's welded. <clears throat> so um, I start with alcohol, rubbing, uh, I not rubbing alcohol, sorry, uh, denatured alcohol. And I wipe it down with denatured alcohol first before any abrasion. The reason for doing that is that if you start with an abrasive process like like a, a wire brush, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you start with an abrasive process, you can actually push contaminants into the, the material. So you can actually embed contaminants in the material um, that you may or may not be able to get out with uh, a wipe down that you do afterward. So start with a wipe down, get the, the surface as clean as you can, then do abrasive cleaning, then clean it again with your alcohol or uh, or uh, acetone. Some people use acetone. I, I learned with alcohol, so I use alcohol. <clears throat> so um, once you've wiped it down, you want to you want to scrub. Now I'm I'm using this to start with. This is a, a stainless steel brush um, from well, actually my employer uh, <laughs> got this at my employer. Uh, I work for a welding distributor, um, but you can get these at welding distributors, hardware stores, uh, the big box stores, wherever, you know, you can find a stainless steel brush there everywhere. <clears throat> um, clean the workpiece thoroughly at least a half an inch away from either side of the root where you're welding and on both sides. The aluminum, once, uh, once it starts flowing, it can suck contaminants from a longer distance than you would think. So um, be thorough and clean at least a half an inch in every direction on both sides. Um, once it starts flowing, if you get full penetration to the root and your, your molten pool of aluminum reaches down to the back side of the weld pool, if you haven't cleaned the back side, guess what's happening? Uh, the, everything that was on the back side gets drawn into the weld pool. And if there's any hydrocarbons, the aluminum is going to hold on to the hydrogen that it gets out of that as well as it can. So uh, uh, be thorough, be very thorough. It's welding jobs are 90% uh, set up and 10% welding. And we welders wish it were the other way because we enjoy the welding part. But uh, the welding part often goes very fast compared to the cleaning and prep. So, um, that covers surface of the material. Second source is atmosphere. So um, we're using shielding gas. Most of us are using argon. Sometimes we might, if we were doing a lot of heavy aluminum welding, we might be using an argon helium mix or even straight helium. I'm using argon. 
whatever it is, it's protecting the it's protecting the weld pool while it's uh, while it's liquid and while it's cooling. In either case, it's much more reactive than when it's at room temperature. So it needs to be covered and protected. Um, atmosphere gets into the weld pool in two ways, in one of two ways, either because you don't have enough flow of the of argon or you have too much. So uh, some people use a rule of thumb that I'm going to grab the torch here. Uh, this is the tech torch that comes with this OTC machine that I'm testing. Um, this is a number eight cup for a, for a gas lens on a number 20, type 20 um, torch. Some people use the rule of thumb that whatever the diameter of the outlet of the nozzle is, you double that in cubic feet per hour of gas flow. So if this is, if this is a number eight, then you're going to have 16 cubic feet per hour on your, um, on your flow meter. Uh, I usually use more than that. Uh, I rarely TIG weld less than 20 cubic feet per hour. I guess if I'm weld welding mild steel, I might go down to 15 cubic feet per hour, depending on what I'm doing. But, um, but I usually start at 20. If you don't have enough gas flow, you don't have enough argon or whatever your shielding gas is to push all the atmosphere out of the weld site as you're welding. So you, you end up with, um, you end up with atmosphere remaining. The atmosphere contains hydrogen. The aluminum loves the hydrogen. The love story begins. So, um, uh, so you want to be sure that you have enough shielding gas. Then on the other side of that, you could have too much shielding gas. Um, I went over to, um, a friend of mine who runs a lab and he's not used to running aluminum welding aluminum uh, and he had a project to do for um, for a manufacturer of a welding filler that um, a, a manufacturer of welding fillers that uh, had a customer complaint that they they were had too much porosity and they were blaming the customer was blaming the wire so the manufacturer wanted to investigate that and they um, they sent a sample of TIG wire to uh, to my friend's lab to test. So he, he was getting all kinds of porosity in the weld and uh, he asked me if I could come over and help and I was honored to help because he's a welding engineer and I'm not. Um, but uh, he, he asked for some experience because he just doesn't do aluminum because most of what he does is in construction. So he asked me to come over and uh, he had his uh, he had his flow meter set at 50, 50 cubic feet per hour, and that was too much argon. It was it was too much flow, and um, what happens is the Venturi effect. The same thing that ha makes your carburetor work, or the same thing that makes your air tools get cold in your hand when you're if you're running a die grinder for an extended period of time, and the tool just gets to be too cold to handle, even if it's summer. Um, as a Venturi effect, um, and uh, the Venturi effect applies here too. So if you you have this size orifice, if you try to push too much gas through it, it's going to become turbulent on this side, and as it passes through the nozzle, it's going to. This is the Venturi effect. It's going to draw atmosphere in from right around the the mouth of the of the nozzle. So it'll, it'll draw atmosphere in, it'll suck it in because it's moving fast enough to, to do that. Um, so you can actually get the same contamination in your weld from too much shielding gas as you would from too little. In either case, it's atmosphere in the weld and it behaves exactly the same way once it gets there. So um, uh, the solution in that lab was to start turning the argon flow down. So I, tur I turned it down to 30 and, uh, and we started from there and we worked it out and we got everything done and the welds turned out fine. Um, so there's such a thing as too much. It's, if you're getting porosity in your aluminum welds and there's nothing uh, else to do, like you've got your workpiece clean and everything seems fine, then, then look at your shielding gas, uh, or your, the flow of your shielding gas. Um, sometimes on rare occasions, you'll have quality issues with your shielding gas, but uh, but that's, that's pretty rare. It's usually a matter of flow or your equipment. Um, that Venturi effect can, can happen in other places too. Uh, the, the, the gas line running from your flow meter back to, down to the machine, if you get cracks in that, 
you can get Venturi effect. It can actually draw atmosphere and you wouldn't think that it possibly could because it's pressurized. Uh, so it's, it's pressurized beyond atmospheric pressure, but it can. Um, same thing can happen inside the machine, uh, downstream of the solenoid. The back of the machine, you have a solenoid that controls the, the starting and stopping of argon flow. And there's a, there's a gas hose of some kind, usually good quality, but there's a gas hose of some kind leading from that solenoid to the front of the machine. It's as simple as that. It doesn't go through some Rube Goldberg device inside. It's just a, just a gas hose from the back of the machine to the front of the machine and then out the torch or out the lead to the torch. So um, if you're getting porosity, checked everything else, flow, your argon flow seems correct, investigate and make sure you don't have broken hoses um, or, or, or cracks. A tiny little uh, hairline on the surface does not mean you're sucking atmosphere through the rest of the hose down into the, into the inner diameter of the hose. So don't go crazy with it. But look, and if you've got something that looks suspicious, then, then change it out. Third source is, uh, is the aluminum itself. Um, I said that aluminum has a high affinity for, for hydrogen. Well, it always has that affinity, including at the time it's being manufactured. So um, when, when, this, is, when this, was, this piece of aluminum here, this was originally a big ingot of aluminum that got rolled out. And as it's from the time it's melted down to the time it's rolled out, heated, um, it's going to, uh, it's being exposed to atmosphere. And especially when it's liquid and, and being cooled, um, it has a, an affinity for hydrogen. And they're not shielding. They're not shielding the, um, they're not shielding the foundry where they're, uh, where they're manufacturing it. So it, it has opportunities to grab that hydrogen and it pulls it in and you have little tiny hydrogen pores throughout these pieces it's it's the nature of aluminum you can't you can't avoid it um, so there is aluminum uh, excuse me there is hydrogen inside the aluminum that you have to that you have to deal with and no cleaning process or anything else is going to deal with that because it's inside the aluminum you don't have access to it until you melt down through the surface and then and then you start exposing it and and it gets included in, in the uh in the weld pool um the only thing to do about that 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 hydrogen is to be sure that the workpiece is not freezing too fast so um hydrogen is extremely light um so it it will readily escape the loving attraction of the aluminum um, if, it, if it has a chance. So um, what you need to do is give it that chance. Um, so as you're, um, as you're making your weld, you need to be sure that the, the weld is hot enough. Uh, aluminum is very, uh, is, is very deceptive when you're welding it. Um, you can make something that looks very pretty but has no strength because it didn't penetrate. Uh, if, you're, if your welds have kind of a, a gray look to them, uh, a dull gray look. Uh, your your weld should be pretty bright and shiny as it's when it's first completed. It's gonna it's gonna oxidize and, and dull over time. But when it's completed, it should be pretty shiny. If it's not, it might be that you're you were too cold as you were welding it. Uh, a piece like this, this is thick. This is probably three quarters of an inch thick here. Until it gets heated up, it's going to it's gonna suck a lot of heat out of the weld pool. And, um, and you, you want to be sure that you've got it up to temperature before you start traveling with the torch, because if you don't, your pool is going to freeze too fast. And if it freezes too fast, it'll freeze before, um, those, at least the larger bubbles of hydrogen have had a chance to escape the tiny, the really tiny ones. You really can't do anything about them. They're going to be there, but the bigger ones, um, they're buoyant enough that they can that they can get up through the hydrogen while you're making the weld if they have a chance. If they uh, if the weld is molten for long enough, um, they can rise out. So um, be sure that you're up to temperature and your that your that your workpiece isn't too cold. Not only are you uh, if you don't, not only are you risking hydrogen inclusion, but you're also um, you're also risking 
lack of fusion into the base material. So a couple of reasons to, uh, to be sure your weld's hot enough. Uh, aluminum is surprisingly deceptive. You can make something that really looks nice, but it's, but it's not strong at all. And keep in mind, when you're welding with an aluminum filler, <clears throat> the, uh, unlike steel, where the, the strength of the weld alloy, the filler alloy, can actually exceed the, the strength of the base material by quite a lot in, in the cases of some steels. Uh, with aluminums, chances are good that your weld site is actually the weakest part of the structure now. So um, do you want to add weakness of the filler material onto a lack of fusion <laughs> and porosity? Uh, so you're, you're taking away more and more of this, the, the strength of the weld. Um, be sure that you've minimized porosity. Be sure that the part is hot enough so that you're getting a chance to boil out some of that, the, the included hydrogen that's inside the material. Make sure it's clean. Happy welding.